the opportunity to present our work here. And um, I changed the title um, a little bit, um, taking you into account previous um, work, and I, um, and also because I, I was here two weeks ago and I talked a lot about olfaction, so I thought I would broaden it to olfaction and visual representation such that there will be um, something. interested in the statistics of nature of scenes and how they influence um, our perception in part because uh, um, when I was switching to neuroscience I, I was interested in what the whole brain does and this nature of scenes the whole visual pathway gets activated as opposed to with more nature, um, simplified stimuli then uh, later parts of the visual system are not um, working and the switch is um, very profound in the olfactory switch, uh, system because uh, if you think about natural olfactory stimuli, so in, in today's talk I will talk about statistics from different plants. One can think of uh, olfaction as a communication system because um, the plant is trying to communicate, um, it's trying to attract, um, and it has to interact with animals and um, one can view fruit as a payment for transportation for seeds. So uh, in the case of olfaction, some of the data that I will show it actually <coughs> illustrates how we can gain insight in the, into the neural circuits by studying the statistics of um, the plant orders because the two are kind of matched together. And um, so um, in, the, in hyperbolic geometry here is uh, also was inspired by why did he went looking for hyperbolic geometry one um, one implication was that both in vision and in other senses there is a um, sort of a two matching hierarchies and um, um, in, for one you know it's easier to put a, a visual scene on the slide than a factory so if you think about um, the relationship of how signals that we receive are generated, there is a hierarchy of underlying objects, they, um, the bear will have its paws and, and so on, So, and the light will get reflected from the object, so we get detailed representations that reflect the underlying objects. And the purpose of our visual system is to reconstruct, uh, based on these detailed representations, what were the objects. So, um, one of the long-term ideas in the field that there are two hierarchies, one within the visual uh, nervous system and the other one inside the um, outside world. And the hyperbolic geometry comes into play because, um, uh, as many of you know, the hyperbolic geometry provides a continuous approximation to hierarchical tree-like structures. So that's some of the uh, motivations um, with, um, for uh, expecting by curvature and hyperbolic geometry and tree-like structures we do. So thinking about our fashion, um, I was, it's a, it's a very in, um, uh, maybe um, interesting domain for theorists to think about. And I was inspired by this article by almost 100 years ago by Alexander Bell, where uh, actually, if you have a chance to read it, it's, uh, he's really a neuroscientist. Uh, he's doing experiments on um, how uh, people can perceive sound. <laughs> so he says, well, if you um, hit two stones underwater, or oh, how loud it is. It's like somebody took a hammer. Um, and then he was amazed that he can hear, he could hear, he sent a boy one mile away in the sound and told him to um, hit the two stones. And he saw when the boy was... Uh, going down there and he put his head in the, one mile away and the water and he could still hear it. So this is how well uh, we can perceive sound. But what he pointed out is that unlike the, uh, um, the theory of um, sound or vision, it's very difficult to measure distances between orders. And until we do so, in his opinion, you know, we have no science of orders. So that was a... Um, and of course, distances between orders is still an open problem. So right now, in human order perception, we identify orders in very qualitative terms. Um, 
So this would be a range of descriptors, um, and some of them are more global than others. And for example, when we choose a wine, right, there's a set of, um, of qualitative descriptors, and some of them, you know, has a peachy feeling. Um, and you go, well, there are no peaches here. <laughs> Uh, so the idea is to ask, uh, maybe to use mathematics, to ask whether we can uh, determine coordinates for order. So that's a long range goal, um, such that we could say, well, I prefer wine in you know, coordinates 3.7. And, um, uh, and what is dimensionality? So in other terms, again, making, maybe making a link to the uh, uh, color perception. So in color perception, I can say I want to paint my walls pink, but I can also go to a store and say here are my RGB coordinates, and they will produce me the color with these coordinates. So the same thing for orders, but in orders it's more complicated because instead of uh, three receptors, we have hundreds of receptors. So does it mean that the space is three-dimensional? So I would argue that it's actually low-dimensional still and show evidence about this. So <clears throat> the link from descriptors, um, to hierarchical structures. Um, actually, it's another introductory slide. It turns out that I was surprised to learn that uh, species were classified before Darwin, you, you know, he constructed a tree. But apparently, what I was told, that he knew that before, well, before him, species were classified uh, in terms of descriptors. How many hoops, what is the shape of the uh, petal of the flower, in ways that, you know, the way is some, somehow reminiscent of how we classify orders. So he knew that we can go from the set of overlapping circles uh, to a tree. And apparently there were games uh, played in the um, parlance of Europe where people would play these classification games. Uh, so the trick from going to descriptors to trees, so that uh, may be a background <coughs> that is familiar uh, to many of you here, but if I have a set of overlapping descriptors, uh, I can construct a tree-like network where the center of each circle becomes uh, the x and y, uh, but the z-coordinate is the size of the circle. So in this, in this way, the, the broadest category gets assigned the largest z-axis, um, and then the smaller one will have a lower, uh, uh, lower position. And so we would have, uh, from a set of descriptors, we can go to hierarchical structure. So if we can do that, then we can maybe have coordinates for orders. So uh, today I will um, talk about uh, curved representation of natural orders. And then I added uh, a little bit about uh, hierarchy and curvature of visual neural representation. So, in, in thinking about the olfactory space, what is known is that most of the orders that we receive are components of um, many orders. So, the classic examples are the smell of coffee, or in the case of the strawberry data that uh, we'll be analyzing, is each strawberry was measured with respect to 80 monomolecular uh, compounds, 80 different molecules. And in fact, if we omit some of these compounds, then the smell that we will perceive will be like bubblegum strawberry. So the humans can tell that it's not the real strawberry. So it turns out there's a data set from food industry. So um, they're working on making a st perfect strawberry for us. And um, um, as, as we know, the taste and smell are coupled taste. Um, um, modalities, and so um, how a fruit will smell has a big impact on how we much we like it and how we perceive um, uh, the taste. So if, whenever I have a cold, um, you know, to, to food doesn't taste as, as good. So uh, anyway, so what the data set consists of um, taking different genetic varieties of strawberries, about 80 of them. And each of them is measured with respect to 80 different monomolecular compounds. So in this case, I'm showing just three, for example. And then there's a question of how to define distance between, say, this molecule and that molecule. So there are multiple approaches. One of them, um, the approach that 
sometimes this paper is to define based on um, chemical similarities, such as the chemical class or whether it's a long carbon chain or a short carbon chain. That's, we will take a different approach um, and take as, uh, as define the distance between molecules, ignoring the chemistry, but how correlated is the concentration of this molecule across cells. So it's a purely statistical approach, and uh, one of the advantages of this is that this approach can be applied to um, any kinds of signals. It doesn't have to be, it can be descriptors, so um, it can be descriptors such as the paddle shape here, and uh, uh, acidity on this axis, and the lengths of the stem on this axis. So it can be any descriptor, and we are just saying how are correlated is the parameter of, um, of this descriptor across sample. The idea is, and so stronger correlation will imply smaller distance. So the motivation for this is that it um, reflects um, kind of a diagnostic view of olfaction. So in every day I smell a sandwich, I want to know is it spoiled or not. So through associations, I may have learned that if a sandwich smells this way, then probably it means there is some bacteria in this and so I don't do a detailed analysis that um, this is a furan or an alcohol I'm smelling. No, well, the reason is that a certain metabolic pathway is activated. It can be induced by bacteria, it can be induced by a plant. And this pathway will produce all kinds of molecules from different classes, but as long as they're correlated, that's what matters to me as a recipient. Um, so that's uh, another motivation is that I don't know any chemistry, so this is a statistical <laughs> by, by definition. Uh, so statistical definition. Um, so then suppose we cannot have a uh, try this out, and uh, so we we talk about we will have a distances between uh, sets of points, and then we can ask what kind of surface they imply. So one example, suppose I give you um, distances between point, uh, major city centers from London to New York, from London to Brisbane, from London to Beijing. At some point, we will figure out that these distances are not consistent with the Flatter's hypothesis. So if the distances are small, they're still consistent, but if the distances are big, they're not consistent. So that's the idea that um, we can place any candidate surface, uh, for example, a sphere. We will put points, in this case, it's in a circle, but you know, in the model, they will be done randomly on this. Um, we measure distances between uh, these points, and we create a pairwise distance matrix between points on this surface um, and how they are related to each other. And so this distance matrix um, will characterize the geometry. So this is a broad idea that we take a distance matrix from strawberry where each of the elements is a monomolecular order and the distances between orders are um, uh, defined from the statistical point of view. And then we want to match this matrix to the pairwise distance from, um, from different candidate geometries. So from each surface, spherical geometry and hyperbolic geometry will be some. And uh, in this case, um, we, so then one can compare these two matrices. There are multiple ways of comparing. One of them is, for example, to subtract the matrices from each other and see how closely they're related. And, uh, but this can be susceptible to distortions uh, if the distances are somehow affected by nonlinearities in the measurement. So from this perspective, um, I was attracted to the method that um, Vladimir Itzkov developed um, for comparing matrices like so. So in the approach that they developed, we take, um, can take a matrix and threshold it at a certain level. And if the correlation between points is higher than a certain threshold, then the corresponding nodes will be connected. So a matrix of pairwise distances becomes a matrix um, and network. And then 
then one can measure the number of cycles or poles within that network. So yes. I mean, this construction certainly goes like trace back earlier than 2015. It's kind of a classic uh, construction computational topology. Uh, computational um, geometry. It's kind of a Groups complex with some threshold. Yes, of course they they do. Um, um, yes, of course it traces that. But what um, um, the reason I cite uh, this paper is because they uh, applied it to neural data and they have shown that the characterization of um, um, this network it can be used to distinguish. Um, uh, I will. Uh, so you can be used to distinguish between different geometries. So using the construction that I described, they, could, they showed that the matrices that are um, taken from a Euclidean geometry would, um, um, and random matrices would be different according to this method. So that's, uh, yes. And so, it's independent of how you thresholded it? Yes, so the reason it's independent is I'm gonna show you um, here an example. So the reason it's independent, um, uh, because um, uh, for the following reason, um, you can, because in reality, in more detail, we put a threshold, and for a given number of, um, for a given threshold, we measure these um, um, number of cycles. So this is number of cycles in. Uh, one dimension, two dimension, and three dimension. So this is very number of one, two, and three. And um, so this is not what the number of cycles um, on the y-axis. And for a given threshold, there will be a certain number of cycles. But then you change the threshold. So as a function of the threshold, um, this number of cycles depends on the threshold, but what's plotted here is um, the integral. Okay, so that's how it becomes independent of the threshold. So uh, initially, when the threshold is, um, say, very large, then only two nodes equal to the largest value, then only two nodes are connected, so there are no cycles. And when the threshold is very low, the network is fully connected, and again, there are no cycles. So the number of cycles um, increases as the network kind of forms, and then the number of cycles disappear as the network gets. So the number of cycles associated with all the different Betty numbers. Yes, yeah, so for each right. Betty number yeah. one, it will be yeah. one curve. Yeah. For Betty okay. number two, there will be another curve. For Betty number three, it's another curve. And um, what was shown in this paper that for a random matrix, the peaks of these Betty curves increases in size. And for a geometric model in the Euclidean space that they analyze, um, and what determines that integral, the area, the conserved quantity? Um, it's not a conserved quantity. What determines is the geometry. Well, it, ultimately, it, the statistical properties of this matrix determine this. But um, what we tried, so in um, Vladimir's paper, they tried random matrices and Euclidean matrices. And we have expanded it to other types of geometry, which is hyperbolic geometry. And what happens is that, for example, in the hyperbolic geometry, um, these peaks drop off with the packet number faster than in the Euclidean geometry. And um, also, uh, another property is um, um, they, it also depends whether you take a slice of the um, slice of the space. Uh, so properties of the space and geometry in general will affect the position of these um, curves and uh, the magnitude. So, so uh, I'm not sure I understand this. Why isn't it discrete? So. Uh, yes, so it has to, <laughs> it is discrete, um, but um, you can run many times, um, take many different samples, and uh, um, in reality, so this will be an average curve across many samples, and 
in real estate <coughs> is air bar. Um, so then it's no longer discrete. And you can do the same thing with data by taking different sub subsamples. So um, if you take points, uh, um, if you have like 80 points and um, you say, well, what happens? How does the geometry changes if, if you subsample? Um, any other questions? Did I, did I address your uh, yeah. question? Yeah, so I, I just assume you have some data, you create this resistance diagram, compare it with the diagram coming from some hyperbolic thing, and then you say, okay, yes. it seems it's at least not consistent. A, yes. Yeah, it's consistent. Um, so, yeah, so that's exactly what this data is. Um, so, this is the actual data. The data points would come from the strawberry data and the uh, colored uh, bars would come from the geometry. So one could say, use it to rule in and rule out, well, uh, just rule out <laughs> different geometries if they do not match, uh, and then explore other possibilities. So, so uh, starting with the strawberry data, there are three different geometries that one could take um, with constant curvature, a spherical geometry with um, positive curvature, Euclidean geometry with zero curvature, and the hyperbolic surface with negative curvature. And the hyperbolic one is, of course, intriguing because it provides a continuous approximation to three like So when we compare it to the data, um, so this is the graph that I showed on the previous slide, uh, we see that the uh, the data from strawberry, which is in triangle, corresponds with um, Betty numbers um, in the first, second, and third quarter from the data. And if we take the same data points and try to optimize dimensionality of the Euclidean space, then we can't match the data. And the same thing is true, for example, for two-dimensional spherical space, um, optimizing uh, curvature. So. This model, of course, has one extra more parameters because we optimize both dimensionality and the curvature um, compared to Euclidean space where we optimize only dimension. Uh, any other questions? So what do you mean by optimizing dimension? Well, so we try different dimensions. Or spaces, maybe. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we try to match um, to account for this data with uh, by sampling points in different dimensionality. So in two-dimensional space, um, you put random points within a two-dimensional space. You evaluate Betty curves, um, Betty numbers, you <coughs> put points in the three-dimensional space, you repeat the procedure in four dimensions, and so on, and see where the, um, either the Betty, the integral of this curve matches the data, or L1 is What do you mean by uh, hyperbolic geometries are approximating trees? In what sense? Um, uh, in the sense that um, both spaces expand exponentially. So think about if you uh, cut, suppose you have a branching process, mm -hmm. uh, then the number of nodes that um, that you can find within a circle of certain radius is an exponential function of the radius. And the same thing is true in the hyperbolic geometry. Kind of the distance and the radius scale exponential. So it doesn't, you know, it, it turns out that it doesn't have to be purely, from my understanding, it doesn't have to be purely tree. Uh, a tree structure can have some loops, but as long as it's approximately a tree. Um, um, so this was um, for strawberries, for a data set of strawberry flavors, but um, actually there are uh, more data sets um, uh, uh, out there. One of them is a data set of mouse urine samples. Um, the data set of blueberry samples, uh, tomato samples, so each of them has different um, 
a number of points uh, from about um, 80 so to about uh, 70, so it varies exact numbers. But um, in the case of all these four data sets, um, they, if we compare their, so the, these triangles are the data, and the best fitting geometry is in these um, colored um, bars. And we see that the hyperbolic geometry in the top row matches the data, and the Euclidean geometry uh, can be ruled out. So, but by what I mean is that uniform distribution random sampling of points within Euclidean space is not consistent with the data. Um, you know, if we force in the Euclidean space points to fall on the hyperbolic curve, then maybe they would. So that's another. And, and you decided to look at only the first three because that's where you have the so, so there are um, uh, two things. A, practically, it, it becomes longer and longer to compute these things. And um, second point is that actually they become noisier. So in reality, it's hardest to fit the first bit because the model, the variability in the third number is usually, qualitatively, is usually larger. So they become, they don't train the data as much. But the first one, you can't really distinguish between the Euclidean and the hyperbolic. Yeah, so, yes. So in this case, you can, um, you can fit. So this is sort of the, <laughs> the trade-off between one is not enough and Things four is to, um, to math. So, um, I, we didn't actually, to be honest, we didn't try to compute Betty, uh, Betty number four um, for computational reasons, but um, it's also, at least when I work with some data sets, I see that the error bar is increasing. So, um, but but is, is the increase in the error bar also somehow perceptually relevant? Maybe I can ask a question slightly differently, because it's telling you about distances of higher order cycles, and is that a sort of a well, finer... I, I don't know because, you know, at this point, this is a mathematical construction to evaluate the network structure, and um, we don't know. Um, um, so this one, uh, this analysis suggests that the hyperbolic geometry in three dimensions is consistent with the data, and next we would like to see how do these, you know, what are the axes in this space. So uh, from a 3D hyperbolic space, you, you forgive my animation, you go to a three-dimensional tree. And the reason is that um, now it's a three-dimensional tree, and it, what it's meant to illustrate is that I will start embedding things into kind of a spherical spaces, because it's a three-dimensional space. And this may be, again, familiar for um, uh, some of you, but um, I will go through some of the constructions. So my thinking is that this is a two-dimensional surface and it's curved. So I need three dimensions to visualize it. And uh, but I, in order to visualize it in the three D space, I will need a four D space. So another way of doing this, we were we are going to compress this two-dimensional surface into. Uh, what is known as a Poincaré disk, um, and then we can represent a two-dimensional surface in two dimensions. And to emphasize that this uh, disk is uh, special, is that I showed here how the distance between these two points in this disk is evaluated, the shortest pass is towards the center of this uh, circle. So uh, think about this tree and to evaluate the distance between points, I have to go um, inside the tree and then out. So that's kind of an approximation to a phylogenetic distance along the tree. So same thing in, will be in three dimensions, so it will be a sphere. And, uh, but it's not an ordinary sphere, so it's like a Poincaré ball um, that is meant to be a circumference of the underlying tree. So if you look at the data from strawberry, this is how the data would fall. And all the points were uh, on the surface of this ball. They didn't have to be, but uh, this is some um, visualization of the points. So uh, 
specific just to say that each point here is a different molecule. And again, I'm illustrating that this would be a shortest distance between two points. Um, and that's um, kind of uh, a rotating uh, representation. So we, we don't have to. Uh, it was curious that there were no points inside, so most of them were distributed around the edge of, um, of this uh, sphere. And uh, the intuition is that that's because these are all volatile molecules. So they are all in the same level of the hierarchy um, of the processing. So they don't cause new molecules because they are volatile and fly away. And they don't so the implication is that if we sample points from within the, um, within the strawberry, then those molecules would be higher up in the hierarchy because they cause the volatiles. And they would, based on their statistical property, they would be inside the sphere. Is that, is that, is that okay? So now this space, what is interesting about it, it doesn't know yet anything about neuroscience. It's just based on the distance between these molecules is how closely and how correlated they are within the uh, natural world. And um, then we color them and the color. And the color now indicates how pleasant these molecules are perceptually. And what one sees is that even though these molecules are, have different chemical groups, but uh, and we added points from uh, two spaces, strawberry and tomato. And the color of the points is the normalized pleasantness. So how strongly was the, um, because these are fruit samples, and for each fruit, um, one can ask people, how much did you like that particular sample? So one can see that there's a continuous topography within this space that was not at all imposed by the analysis. We indi indicates that um, we prefer uh, certain kinds of coordinates in that space. And this is kind of an illustration that uh, the olfactory system must have uh, some topography because, um, and statistical correlation could reveal it because we are not interested in a, um, this specific molecule, but the idea is that there are uh, underlying metabolic pathways that is represented by these water molecules. Um, yes. Sorry, just a clarification question. So the molecule pleasantness was not done one molecule at a time. Is that right? It was it was in the conjunction of the it is in the fruit. It's in the fruit. It yes. the, so the, one can do um, in the paper we also had the same map for <coughs> the mixtures. So in this case, um, so the, the data is that you have a sample and you have a pleasantness value. So we can either make it um, plot mixture. So we can plot mixtures in that space using kind of linear coordinates for each molecule and combining them to plot mixtures and color them based on the likeness value. And um, But in this case, it's individual water molecules. So the pleasantness for the molecule is how correlated it is with the Value. So I guess I was wondering if, you know, because uh, these distances are based on co-occurrence of these molecules in these different fruit, right? And and then you're saying the pleasantness is also based on, you know, from, from it's derived from the occurrence in the fruit and the co-occurrence. So doesn't doesn't does not well, cause smoothing that, by the data. That, that's right. But then there's some smoothing that's happening because of this, right? I mean, isn't there a smoothing by a similar kernel for both the distance metric and also for the pleasantness metric? Well, I'm not, just wondering, are they truly independent, or is there like well, a similar smoothing? Well, they're not smoothing? independent because, uh, um, because data is not independent, right? So because of this is what we want to find. How correlation, so if the coordinates reflect how correlated are the correlations between molecules, and this also is the pleasantness value. So they're, you know, they're correlated because they're underlying molecular passages. I think that answers the bad. I would like to talk a little bit more detail about whether there's a way to get 
Is it possible to ever have something that's not smooth on this? A coloring here that's not smooth. But uh, we can discuss it. Um, well, as a shuffle, um, as a control, um, that would be one. That's, that's the only way how I can quickly answer. Um, so the other um, axis, so one, can, so one of the axes I've drawn here is the pleasantness axis. There are other axes here um, that one can define and maybe that will help um, answer Hila's question. Uh, those axes are defined with um, molecular boiling point of the molecule, meaning how easy it, um, it evaporates, and also its acidity, um, uh, acidity of the sample. So um, maybe that is partly addressing um, in this question. One, we can separate the training you know, data into training and test data sets to show that if the axis is obtained using a sub-sample of um, subset of orders and make predictions for pleasantness for new orders, one can have a significant correlation with the p value. Um, if you use molecular weight, does it also correlate? For example, I, mean, I would imagine boiling point and molecular weight are very tightly yes, correlated. Yes, so there are many axes, and these are not unique axes. So, uh, I would imagine that many axes, I'm not sure whether it would be significant for molecular weight, but it's possible. So um, this is, then it becomes a product of uh, uh, generating a hypothesis to align. These are the, just three candidate axes. Um, and um, here's some data. But the idea is that if we believe that the space is low dimensional, then these axes are no longer independent. And one can predict one using other axes. And um, in this particular case, the goal is uh, sometimes it's an open question and I'll question about how to predict the pleasantness of a new molecule ahead of time. So this suggests that if I know the axis on molecular boiling point and acidity, maybe molecular weight, um, um, then you can predict the uh, once, well, the two axes are sufficient because it's uh, um, roughly an approximately two dimensional space in this case. So, um, in this case, if I know the projections on the two axes, you can predict projections on the third axis. And does this accuracy predict the pleasantness of the model? So, the open <coughs> question then is to maybe these are um, kind of first order axes, but more interesting axes would be the axes that are associated with underlying metabolical pathways. So one thing is like ripening of the strawberry. So one direction could be, in some of the preliminary data, green strawberries are in one part of the space, the ripe strawberries are in another part, and over rotten strawberries are in another part, so there's maybe kind of a maturation axis in this space, and other axis is fermentation by this bacteria or that bacteria. Uh, could you specify a bit more precisely the relation between your correlation coefficients and the uh, between uh, a pair of compound set and uh, the hyperbolic distance that you're, you have here? Um, I gather that's what you did. Is you had some way of yes, so turning the correlation, correlation coefficients into correlation taking an absolute value and e to the minus that is the distance. Yes, and then um, the idea being that, at least with this topological method, if it is passed through a one-to-one -one, um, nonlinearity, then the answer is, for, for a topological method, it should, um, should be independent with respect to one-to-one um, -one nonlinear transformations, because it's based on the rate ordering of the values. Right? Um, all it matters is at the relative um, how does the threshold uh, who is in what order the connection between nodes are added. So you didn't use the actual numerical values. So in the topological method, you you do, but what it matters is um, 
kind of the, the rank ordering. If I distort the bounds. Are we looking here at a picture of the topological method or the uh, geometric method? This one method? is not topological. This it's is geometric. The geometric. With yeah. the this is, yeah. This is, once you know, so I mean topology is kind of the first order guess of what the space is. Mm -hmm. And then we use multidimensional yeah, scale. That. Uh, but, uh, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Yeah, so maybe you've answered this question. Um, so the perfect spher sphericality here doesn't actually represent the projection from uh, the hyperbolic space, right? Yeah, so it's a little bit um, confusing. I don't know how to get to get out of it. So I plot. I, I said that the spherical space does not account for the data, and then I plotted points right, yeah. in the spherical space. Um, so, but this is just to say that. If I evaluate distances between these points, it won't be, it will be um, kind of in a special way that reflects the. So this sphere is like a compression of that um, hyperbolic space that it's, uh, into into manageable thing. So one of the issues with hyperbolic space is that it's hard to visualize it precisely because the number of states is expands exponentially. So various ways are. Um, but if you had different. needles coming out from a center, you could you could visualize something about the deviation from sphericality, right? Yeah. And we would see them. Yeah. So I think what you're asking is whether the points are distributed uniformly or not. Is that is that the? I think the question is mm, what the sphere represents. Whether it's some sort of hypersurface in your uh, in your space or whether two points there could still be like, I don't know, on which radius in your Poincaré disk you are, or yes, if, if, whether right. these are kind of just projections? In, like, no, like it is, not... it's really a three-dimensional Poincaré ball, so it is a, it's a filled space where you, you can go within, the, uh, within this space and um, it, it is three-dimensional. So the argument is that the olfactory space is three-dimensional with hyperbolic metrics. So it's not a compression of a larger dimensional space. That, you know, I'm not going to defend too much. Uh, I mean, the, the current stage of the data, the three-dimensional space is consistent with the data. So, and it's not higher dimensional. So, oh, no, um. <laughs> so first it sounded like you were saying this uh, sphericality was just a plotting device. Now it sounds like you're saying, yes, it was perfectly spherical. Yes, um, it is three-dimensional hyperbolic space that we use a sphere to represent. Uh, a sphere with the interior yes. as a yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So this really does say something about the data, and based on your interpretation, it says that there was never a case <coughs> Uh, that everything is at the same level in the tree. There was never a case where A was correlated with B, A was correlated with C, but B was not correlated with C. So um, there are, I, I will show you the results of the perceptual data. Um, let me maybe um, skip um, a little bit to a different slide, and that will... This is um, from Nature World. This is analysis of the different data sets. Now, human perception. So we skip from Nature World. Um, this is the Dravnik's data set um, from 1985 of uh, different synthetic orders that, that were arranged by human observers. And in that case, we also found that the three-dimensional hyperbolic space describes the data. But the difference with the natural orders are that the points are now both within the space and outside the, um, it's, it's now a filled space. And uh, in this case, the size of the circle is, it represents its radius. So the bigger the points are on the outside and the inner points are smaller on the inside, yes. Okay, just to clarify, so you have your three-dimensional hyperbolic uh, space, you have your 
I don't know, this data set where you have the, like the distance matrix for. And now you embed the data set in that space such that uh, this isn't up preserved more or less, right? And then in your case of the strawberry and tomato, yeah. it just happened to be, it, it lands on the, on the, on the, on, on the outer sphere and in, the, in your human perception data, it, it can also be inside of it. Yes, uh, I think the reason it lands on this sphere here is because it's a subset of chemicals that are volatile that are produced by the plant. So if it was, um, uh, we can also correlate it with uh, chemicals that are non-volatile that are from the cell in principle. And my intuition is that those ones would fill the space. The reason being that they are the ones that produce the volatiles that we smell. So in that case, the chemical that is more higher up along the biochemical pathway will produce two offsprings, and its correlation, it will be correlated with both of them, and so it will, that molecule will have a kind of a more primal uh, coordinate. So that's, you know. Um, so, um, so, and in this case, this is actually um, the data set um, from Dravniks, um, um, an older data set, and there's actually very little overlap between orders that were in the natural strawberry data set and in the Dravniks data set. And even though these molecules were designed to probe uh, different parts of human perception, at least this analysis suggests that there is sort of a wide um, uh, open space to be probed um, in terms of human perception, adding new molecules. So just, I guess, what would it look like if you, I mean, if you just have Euclidean distances in your, uh, in your in the previous there, or um, sphere, then? I, I don't have that data, but I had um, data comparing um, distances uh, with multidimensional, uh, we didn't do the visualization, but um, we did um, kind of distances before embedding and after embedding, um, and compared Euclidean space with hyperbolic space. So in the case of hyperbolic space, uh, the data points are kind of more along the line, and with the Euclidean space, it's kind of um, a cloud of points that has um, kind of curvature. Anyway, I don't have a slide, so this is my uh, interpretive dance of the data. Maybe we should allow the speaker to conclude, unless this is your last. Um, well, I, maybe that would be might be a good way um, to stop, um, and then I will then, uh, since uh, I'm happy that there were so many questions, uh, I'm not going to go then into the uh, visual representation. Thank you very much. Burning questions, maybe you can take one or two more, otherwise, you continue over tea. And then... Well, I will, uh, if there are no questions, I will I just show one piece of data. <laughs> this is my question to myself. Can I do that? Absolutely. I'll ask a question. Could you show a piece of data? <laughs> Could you show a piece of data? <laughs> what? Oh, no. The one we're going to show. I'm making it official. So this one, um, argument for why hyperbolic geometry. So this is an intriguing piece of data um, showing how um, actually humans can systematically assign different olfactory molecules into cells. All, all humans? This is not synesthesia? This is... Real human? This is human number one. No, no, no. Human it's, number not, two. it's not synesthetic human. These are... No, normal humans, okay. yes. Um, so and apparently, you know, this one, this order would be consistently higher frequency than the other order. So I think they're then ordered by frequency by this subject, and this is another subject. So um, anyway, so I thought... Uh, is there a molecular weight dependence? <laughs> we can check. So anyway, I thought, um, um, and the upper. So this is uh, just the index of the orders, and this is the frequency uh, to which they match the particular order. Okay, let's continue the conversation over tea. Thank you very much.